Douglas is a leading uh, conservative writer, columnist, journalist. Uh, he was among, and I would love to stress this, those rare British intellectuals who firmly stood behind our old-time friend, uh, uh, philosopher Roger Scruton, when he was falsely accused of intellectual misconduct in a time of growing culture war in Britain. In Prague, uh, Douglas uh, Murray is well known uh, because of his previous book, The Strength of Europe, which was published in the Czech language, and his new book, which was published in uh, the UK and uh, US uh, late last year, as I told you, is just uh, being translated and will come soon. Uh, beyond other, uh, Douglas is regularly contributing his reviews to Spectator, which is his domestic magazine weekly, uh, as well as to the Wall Street Journal Times and many, many other newspapers. We decided to frame the debate uh, under the title The Culture Wars in Times of Pandemia. And I will start with um, um, a question which relates uh, really to the title of our conversation. So what happened in, in Minneapolis was certainly appealing and, and deplorable, but why so many people uh, decided to extend the blame so far and so wide? Has the virus and uh, an attempt to contain it uh, any role in mobilizing a mob behavior in the West? Is there a direct linkage uh, between the lockdowns and the current revolts in the streets, which we can see not just in the US? And why intellectuals are so much driven by this kind of a mob behavior? Thank you very much. It's very good to be with you all. And uh, I do hope very much that whenever we're allowed out of our houses again, that uh, I can make it to Prague uh, and nothing would give me greater pleasure. Um, all of these issues are intertwined at the moment, aren't they? <clears throat> and the thing that strikes me uh, is that several things that I've written about, not just in my latest book, In the Madness of Crowds, but in the book before that, The Strange Death of Europe, which you were kind enough to refer to, um, many of the issues in that book are also swilling around in uh, the global debate that's going on at the moment. In relation to the uh, to the recent events, recent months, I'd, I'd make this observation first, which is that when the coronavirus first began, uh, I was struck by the fact that the globe had a serious issue to contend with, a serious public health issue. And it seemed to me uh, that it was extremely likely that uh, identity politics movements and let's say the grievance cultures uh, that have been rampaging in recent years would have to take a step back in that situation. That is that when pretty much everybody in society had uh, real grievances, uh, not least being locked in our homes or many people losing their jobs and of course many people dying or at least being very unwell, uh, that with everyone contending with serious problems, um, frankly frivolous claims uh, of not very significant uh, um, problems would diminish, it would take a, a back seat. So um, when you have a public health issue as we've had in recent months, it seemed to me that microaggressions, for instance, might be taken even less seriously than they should have been taken before that. So that was my presumption. And I said a number of times and wrote a number of times in the early weeks of the pandemic that it was my prediction that uh, that there would be a wider societal intolerance for the most um, egregious and extreme claims of the identity politics movements. That is, um, people claiming that uh, there was not enough, um, I don't know, awareness of non-binaryism and uh, too much use of um, um, he, he, she pronouns and not of they, them ones, those people might just have to pipe down for a bit because uh, the wider society just wouldn't, wouldn't be, be able to uh, treat them with the, the sort of uh, 
intense fear and respect that they had hitherto. But I also said that at the same time, there might be a wider societal intolerance for, for those sorts of claims. The people making them would be likely to double down. And uh, I think there was evidence early on that that was the case. And I'm thinking particularly of attempts that various uh, groups, media groups and individuals were making to say, for instance, that coronavirus disproportionately targeted women. Uh, uh, this was widely claimed on the left from the Guardian to the New York Times. When the statistics then showed that actually men were disproportionately likely to die from coronavirus, these same people turned on a dime and said, well, the men might be doing the dying, but the women are doing the suffering in some wider sense. And I, I just noticed there wasn't very much tolerance for those arguments, just to again interpret absolutely everything through these sorts of prisms. Uh, but, but that was what was, was going on. There was a more... Um, uh, widely shared attempt to racialize the virus. In Britain and in America in particular, we had this in people claiming that ethnic minorities were disproportionately likely to suffer from the virus. Now, as it happens, there are statistics that, uh, that do confirm some of that. And there is an investigation in, in the UK, a government investigation into why that might be. What strikes me is that it seems obvious that, that there are quite a number of factors that might explain that. There are ones that do with um, underlying health conditions in ethnic minority communities, uh, possibilities of larger um, over, uh, rates of overweightness, uh, of possible uh, underlying genetic conditions, or there could be behavioural things. For instance, friends in New York anecdotally told me from the very beginning that some of the black areas uptown in New York, uh, uh, people were just not social distancing. And these would seem to me to all be, you know, interesting and important things to look at to try to learn lessons from. What, what I was struck by was the fact that the people stressing this, uh, the media and politicians stressing this, particularly in America, but in Britain as well, seemed to be implying that we couldn't even import a virus from China without using it against ethnic minorities and making it a racist virus against them. Uh, and that was the underlying claim that I, you, you, you could read in, in any day's newspapers. Um, so, so yes, the virus seemed to me to be causing these people to embed the, uh, the, basically the, the worldview that they'd been trying out. Um, in some ways, that's not at all surprising because it, um, if you see everything, I, I mean, everybody present I know knows this, but if you see everything through a single ideological prism, it doesn't actually matter what that ideological prism is. Once you see everything through a specific ideological prism, any evidence that comes up that might contradict it, it is simply something, something you have to either ignore or somehow manipulate and push it into the ideological prism you have. So um, not many people uh, outside the fields of expertise had been studying pandemics in recent years. This is an entirely new thing for most people to think about. And if you believe that our societies are only understandable through power structure dynamics or through racial politics or through, you know, male, female, um, zero sum game politicking, then you will continue trying to do that in this area as you did before. So all of this seemed to me to be going on. The, um, uh, the thing that I thought was surprising was the, the moment at which that all, that all um, took itself to a new level. And that is, as you just mentioned, with relation to events in Minnesota. I think that historians will have a very clear explanation for how this came about. It seems to me you cannot uh, um, lock up the population for three months without there being significant uh, um, blowout at some point. Uh, I think it could have been caused by any number of things. Uh, but what we saw was very interesting because it's my view that in a country like Britain, for instance, the whole point of the lockdown was to protect the National Health Service. Um, it turned out that anti-racism, 
was even more important than the national religion that is the National Health Service in the UK. It had seemed to me that there was nothing more important in the UK than the NHS. But then we'd learned that actually there was something more important, so important that the government, police and others, which had been lambasting people for meeting more than three people in their garden only 24 hours before, suddenly allowed demonstrations of thousands of people very tightly packed together to congregate in major cities. And in the US, this was even more stark, of course. In the US, there were, um, there were petitions of hundreds of medical professionals who signed uh, uh, open letters in the United States saying that yes, we were in the midst of a pandemic and ordinarily we would not advise that people congregate. However, racism is such a public health crisis that it trumps the pandemic and therefore it's totally legitimate to gather in public places, squashed closely towards each other and protest against racism. And throughout this, almost nobody seemed to point out that if ethnic minorities were indeed, for whatever reason, disproportionately likely to die of the COVID virus, it was unwise to then encourage ethnic minorities and others to congregate in large public places and, uh, and, and so on. But the point is, is this showed that the underlying ethic of the era, the one that absolutely trumped everything, was anti-racism. Um, I think, by the way, there's something which is... Um, been too little raised in all this, which is the extent to which we see in this, I mean, there's been a lot of talk of globalization in the era of the pandemic. I think one of the least talked about aspects of globalization, which I find most interesting, has been um, highlighted in this, which is the way in which globalization allows one country's culture wars to spread out and metastasize in no time across the globe. So how is it that the death of a black man in Minnesota at the hands, knees of a cop um, can lead to, within days, people standing outside Downing Street in London hurling abuse and missiles at the British police. How is it that within a week this uh, event in America, this tragic event in America, turns into a war on statues, uh, leads to a mob in Bristol pulling down a 19th century statue to an 18th century slave trader and philanthropist. How is it that by now, last night, there's another attack on a statue of George Washington in America that's pulled down? How is it that it's led to the disappearance of an episode of the comedy Faulty Towers? Or the, or the, the, um, the inserting of trigger warnings on, uh, on, uh, on movie after movie, book after book? Um, I think this is this is a really fascinating question. And I think that one of the problems that we're going through is that an interpretation of racial politics in America is being used to overlay very inaccurately, and I think unjustly, a specific American issue onto every other culture in the West. Uh, I think it's enormously uh, unproductive and I'm struck by the fact, maybe this is a very long answer to your question, but there's a, there's a lot to say on it. I'm struck by one other thing in particular on this, which is the seeming inability of politicians and others, almost everybody in the public square, to make any stand against the stampede that is currently uh, occurring. So it seems to me, um, rather surprising that uh, a, a group like Black Lives Matter can get uh, as far as they've currently got almost unopposed. Now, I, I, of course, there are some uh, built-in reasons for that. One of the built-in reasons is that people find it incredibly hard to oppose organizations whose very name is chosen in order to be non-oppositional. And what I mean by that is that we get somewhere near the, 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 the territory we were in with the word multiculturalism. I, my, one of my critiques of the term multiculturalism was always it was set up to be unopposable. I mean, there are no people who declare themselves to be uniculturalists or monoculturalists. Um, and so multiculturalism seemed to be almost impossible to, to oppose because it, it could mean so many things, but it had no, no, no thing that was in opposition, that, that was in opposition to it. 
Um, I think we're in very similar uh, terrain with Black Lives Matter because they talk as if there is some large entity or grouping of society that goes around saying black lives don't matter. And there isn't, they, they, they are a non-opposed force to that extent. And that's very clever, of course, because you, you, um, you make an enormous land grab at that point. And that's what Black Lives Matter has done. They've, with an, unopposed, an unopposable name, they've made a land grab that is huge. Uh, a, a group that states in its uh, founding principles that it, it is dedicated not just to the um, uh, eradication of what it calls white supremacy, but the eradication of capitalism, for instance. Now, I don't think that a group that says, and, and also to all state structures, now, a group that is opposed to all state structures and wants to dismantle all state structures and wants to dismantle the, capital, uh, the capitalist economy is obviously a very far left radical group who should be opposed. But what do we see in recent days? We see corporation after corporation paying their basically jizzier uh, uh, to Black Lives Matter, promising to donate to them huge sums of money being donated um, to this, I think, very questionable um, group and a very questionable cause. What I think is, what I think is happening is that people uh, are, are deeply fearful of saying um, that they are opposed to this group because the first thing that happens is people say you must be opposed to the idea that Black Lives Matter, therefore you must be against Black Lives, therefore obviously you're a racist. And um, it's extraordinary what, what a successful move this has been. Um, but I think that it requires sensible people of any political persuasion to say, um, no, we need to find the, the brakes on this thing. Uh, a, a, a terrible, horrible killing uh, of a man in Minnesota does not allow uh, cultural Marxists and revolutionaries to dictate our history or do this very strange, highly retributive attack on, on basically everything that got us here. Um, so I think there will be a pushback, but it's been almost silent in, uh, in my country and indeed in America, I think. Uh, can you explain me one thing? Because, you know, this widespread concept of the guilt as, mm. as a source of, uh, uh, of a certain change has been transformed, I would say, even into a tyranny of the guilt, as uh, to, to quote Pascal Brickner, who was uh, yeah. uh, writing about this. Uh, you know, we remember this from, from Germany, how it uh, formed uh, the core of their national identity yeah. and, yeah. And, and a source of some current problem too. But uh, in the form of BLM, it now encompasses this public discourse in the US and the UK, uh, a guilt for colonialism, for slavery, history. Uh, you know, when I was writing something about this, uh, because it, it was some echo has been also here with um, some small vandalization of, of Winston Churchill's statue in Prague. Uh, but it was a minor incident, but I, I, I wrote, you know, a question, you know, why in the UK Ch Churchill has to be defended by, uh, by the football fans? Why uh, your politicians, including Boris Johnson's are, are so passive in, in mm. them. And, uh, yeah. you know, this, uh, this is, we in the East <laughs> relied a lot on the West. The West was for us the moral, and now we see uh, an unwillingness of our allies in the West to defend the West as we know it. And uh, just, you know, I remember that in, in, in your previous book, uh, On the Death of Europe, you wrote also that, uh, you know, the future of Europe uh, will uh, be shaped uh, according to how we would be able to treat our, uh, our, our past, you know, mm. including the, 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 the sculptures. So mm. can you explain 
at the moment of this crisis, you know, and the crisis, it should be a moment of certain mobilization of, of us. Yes. Uh, so why we are willing or the West is willing to, to undermine its foundation, why they are lacking the courage to, to stand behind uh, not just the statues, but also some <laughs> principles uh, which, without which I cannot imagine to survive. Yes, I, I, there are several reasons. I can, may I give, first of all, a rather prosaic one, which is that I think there was a specific issue in Britain, which is that our Prime Minister, of course, Boris Johnson, himself caught the coronavirus and had it pretty bad. Uh, it was, in fact, in intensive care for a number of days. It, it said, I don't have any special insight about this, I haven't seen him for some months, but it said that he uh, had taken much longer to recover from it than uh, people were hoping. He had gone back to work pretty swiftly uh, when he was meant to have been resting for longer. And I think it's, it's meant that it, it, rather visibly until really only last week, he has not been himself. Uh, he, he looks a lot shaken and, uh, um, uh, you know, he, he had a bad time of it. My own view is that if Boris Johnson had been at peak health, health as it were, that I think that some of the extremes of what's happened in the UK would not have happened. Boris Johnson wrote a book about Winston Churchill a few years ago. He spent his political career, let's say, not uh, shrugging off attempts to compare him to Winston Churchill. He <laughs> he he doesn't resile from the from the claim of a comparison. So I think it's uh, uh, pretty extraordinary that, that, that somebody like him could have uh, had the statue of Winston Churchill just around the corner from T Downing Street attacked repeatedly and ending up having to be boarded up and, and much more the Senate after the war dead being defaced repeatedly. I mean, these are, these are for the British public a very, very serious set of attacks on our sources of national pride. But that was a rather prosaic, but I think relevant issue. Now, the wider point, I think, is something as you referred to which I, I i dealt with in a chapter named after the pascal bruckner's tyranny de la penitence uh, uh which is um w w w and in that chapter i mentioned something which I, i've tried for a long time to get people to to wrestle with which is this it's become my view that in the multicultural era the, the, the term i dislike but let's say in the in the um in the era in which western countries have increasingly diverse populations um people have struggled to find a way to come up with unifying cultures. Now, um, because of the religion of anti-racism and uh, much more, uh, uh, there is a, um, a pressure on the host society to uh, talk up the achievements of other cultures. And there's some good reasons for it, good justifications for that. You don't want to look like you're being bigoted. You don't want to look like you're pushing people away. Um, so you talk about, well, the example I always give is the Islamic Neoplatonists. You know, Nobody talked about the Islamic Neoplatonists much until 9-11. Yeah, um, uh, and then after that, everybody starts talking about how much we've gained from Islam and how the Islamic Neoplatonists basically gave us all of our thought. Okay, it's a it's a very weird version of history, but it's it's one that became very popular uh, uh, in the last uh, nineteen years. Uh, there are lots of other versions of that. Now, it seems to me that there's a counterforce to that one of talking up uh, uh, cultures that uh, have come into your country in large numbers. The counterforce of that is to slightly talk down or massively talk down your own culture. I think the idea of this is that at that point we sort of meet somewhere on an agreed version of history. I don't think that's going to happen by the way, but I think there's something like that is the expectation. Now, the oddity of this, and I mentioned this in the Strange Death of Europe, one of the oddities of it is that the following thing happens. All cultures that are non-Western, non-Judeo-Christian Western cultures, all other cultures are primarily defined in this era by their best moments. So it is agreed that only a bigot would regard Muhammad Atta as being representative of Islam. It is agreed that the Islamic Neoplatonists are characteristic and typical and the main representatives of Islam. Simultaneously, the Western countries are regarded not 
by their best moments, but only by their worst. So that, uh, as I say in The Strange Death of Europe, you have this strange thing that Europeans, and indeed all white people, to use the term which I hate hearing coming back, but is coming back because of the so-called anti-racists, that all white people must be held responsible for Nazism, for instance. It doesn't matter if you're from a country that fought Nazism, a country which was uh, um, repressed by Nazism, uh, um, crushed by it. Nevertheless, somehow this is something of a guilt that everyone is meant to share. Now that's the darkest, most recent version of this. But one of the versions of this as well is the one that has now been embedded about slavery. It is an extraordinary thing, this, by the way, because you can see it very clearly in the British example. Nobody denies uh, uh, British colonial history. I think any reasonable person regards this as being a rather um, uh, complex issue morally to contend with. Uh, that somebody who said everything about colonialism was abhorrent is not correct and neither is somebody who says that everything about colonialism was terrific and it's true that we're in some kind of re-estimation of our past on this one but the fact that the country that led the way in the abolition of slavery should end up being in 2020 characterized typified as the colonialist slaving power is i think a curious turn, and I'll tell you what I think is going on. Um, Roger Scruton, who you mentioned, uh, um, introduced me some time ago to a very, a very useful um, way of seeing through and hacking away at some of the thickets that we enter here. And this was to, to, try, to try to separate out your critics from your enemies. A critic is criticizing you in order to improve you. The enemy just wants you dead. So the critic is somebody who says, I think there are aspects of your past which you haven't got enough understanding of, or we don't have enough understanding of, and we need to contend with it, and we need to better educate ourselves. And that's a very, very reasonable uh, thing to do. I think I would, be in I would include myself in that, uh, that we are critical of our past in that sense that we, need, we, we wish to understand it and we wish to some extent to learn from it and improve ourselves. That is totally different from somebody who says, you are and always have been a racist people. You always have been oppressors, looters. You have nothing going for you other than your racism. That is the only thing that typifies you. And as a result, we believe that everything about you should be fundamentally altered. Now that is, I believe, the tone in which we are being addressed at the moment. If somebody came along and said, the only thing that's important to remember about Britain and its history of slavery is the fact that it abolished slavery, I would say that person was being simplistic. If they said, that doesn't matter, the most important thing is you were always slavers, then that person is not being a critic. They are speaking about my society as an enemy. And I think that this is a very important delineation that needs to be made. You know, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick, former um, um, US official uh, under Reagan, uh, said once about the anti-Vietnam protests in America, something which I've always felt to be very important and penetrating. She said, nobody denied that America couldn't be better, but in order to be better, it had to survive. And I think the same with my own country and, and indeed America at the moment on this. To improve a society is a very different thing. Or to try, try to, to iron out any remaining injustices that, are, that exist is a different thing from saying this society was always rotten, racist, bigoted, misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic, and much more. And therefore, we must pull down your economy, we must wage war on all of your past, and we must show the world that you are unredeemable, irredeemable bigots. Now, I don't myself particularly like to be talked to in that tone of voice, but I'm struck by how many people are willing to be talked to in that tone of voice. 
And this, by the way, uh, just one other point I may make on that, if I may, which is the Winston Churchill point, which is so revealing about the current view of history that is being embedded in the younger generation in particular. And by the way, at this stage, this is becoming very clear. We are talking at the moment about a, a divide that has broken out between people under the age of 30 and people over the age of 30. This is the case of what Barry Weiss depicted in her, in her description of what has been going on in the internal war in the New York Times. And this isn't a left-right thing. This is people above the age of 30 who, assume, who are even self-described liberals, who thought the people coming up underneath them had the same presumptions they did. For instance, the idea that a free exchange of ideas is deeply desirable in a free society. Not so among some of the under 30s on this. They believe that a free exchange of ideas risks discomfort unsafety and much more so this this divide however it can be something very important can be seen in relation to the churchill point and i'll just make this point if i may before going back to you the churchill point is revealing for a particular reason the people who believe that winston churchill is a terrible person reveal something extraordinary about their own ignorance of history in general not just of the history of winston churchill um, now what they do is they say, Winston Churchill may have um, been the, the, the main force that caused Britain to stand up to Nazi Germany, even at the point at which America did not, and as the Nazis were rampaging across Europe. Winston Churchill may have done that. He may have been the person most able to be claimed at that stage in 1940 to have been standing against fascism, but, he also drank too much. Or, by the way, I've never thought that a particular sin, but that's, or they say, ah, but in 1911, uh, uh, Tony Pandy, when he was in the government, he got the police to suppress a riot and a Welsh uh, a man was killed. Or they say, much more seriously to contend with, look at the Bengal famine. And by the way, my friend Andrew Roberts, who's the most recent and most distinguished, I think now, biographer of Churchill, is very eloquent on this issue. Um, uh, Andrew Roberts uh, 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 argues that they are totally wrong on their claims about the Bengal famine. But the interesting thing is not where they're wrong. Let's say that they're right on some of these things. Let's say that they've got something. It would have been thought to be the case, I think, until now, that you regarded a historic figure in the round. So you didn't say, because this person historically did one thing that I disagree with, he is unredeemable, must be pulled down, must be uh, uh, um, not be venerated, not be admired. Of course, what you discover if you go down that road is nobody in history, could possibly live up to the standard that you are setting. And there is, there is not just the antagonism that I described earlier, the difference between an enemy and a critic, but several other things going on once you go down this path. I believe, by the way, that what has happened with the Churchill thing is dangerous among other things because of what I regard as a problem of potential innovation in the society. When people talk about young people being, um, uh, you know, fearful and, and fragile and lots more, I think they don't contend enough with the fact that there are good reasons if you are young and you live in this highly interconnected age to worry about your actions. You worry that if you say a word wrong, it could go all around the world and you will forever be known as the person who used the wrong word. That's very, that's a very, um, uh, it's a very tiring thing to have to contend with at the beginning of your lifetime and indeed throughout it. The Churchill negativity, I think, among other things, is highly enervating for a young person because it says, you know, our society used to agree that if there was a something that was really good, it would have been to have been against Nazism. And the best thing would have been to have led the world for a period in opposing Nazism. But... If the person who even did that held one view that we today regard as being wrong, their toast, their history, gone. What this says to you is that acting in the world is basically futile or pointless because this retributive view of history will be applied to you as well. And I believe that the, there is a profound misunderstanding of history that is going on at the moment. 
and before handing back to you, I just said, you know, one of the one of the quotes I have kept in mind most in this has been one of my favorite quotes from Milan Kundera, who um, in Testaments Betrayed said something so important. I always say this to young audiences. I always say to them, you know, in Testaments Betrayed, he says that man walks in a fog. He, he, he stumbles along the path and creates the path as he goes. This isn't the important uh, uh, point. The important point is that Milan Kundera then says the, that when we look back, we see the man, we see the path, but we don't see the fog. That everything looks like it was going to end up where it is once it's happened. But you don't know as you're going along where it's going to go. And the interpretation of history that is being wheeled out, the history of history simply as emancipation, endless right struggles and so on, says, we standing where we are are so uniquely enlightened and brilliant and so faultless that we can look back at everyone before us and judge them for failing to have our current views. And as I said in the Telegraph on Saturday, I think a much more useful exercise is to say, assume since every age before ours has done things that we find amazing, and indeed reprehensible. Assume that we will be doing some such things as well and try to work out what they are now. And I would suggest that there's one that's very, very much in front of our faces in the COVID era, which is this. How will a future um, historian judge people in 2020 who were so enraged by slavery historically 200 years before, that they pulled down statues and graffitied monuments and leveled buildings and burnt down businesses, all whilst wearing t-shirts made in slave factories in the Far East. And I would have thought a future historian would say, how did they not know that? Giant inconsistency. And then they would realize we did know. We just tried to pretend it away. And then our statues will come down too. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I think that, you know, this is partially the effect of the, simply the fact that the, the way how history is being now uh, uh, teached mm. uh, in the West is a totally mm. wrong concept. Yes. And uh, Henry Kissinger has uh, remarkably uh, criticized this, that they simply no more teaching this as a sequence of certain events, mm. but just based on the criteria of the current ideological uh, stance. And it's, it's nonsense because uh, we should eradicate everybody from the history, just measure this by our current standard. There is no room for Socrates. There is no room for King David. There is no room for anybody. In, in fact, if you put this uh, uh, Churchill standard uh, or anti-Churchill standard on that. But um, uh, maybe there are some exceptions, even despite that, and that's Marx, Engels, and even Lenin, because we, <laughs> in, the, in the era of iconoclasm, uh, when, you know, they are putting down Columbus, George Washington even, uh, they are eradicating, they are now raising the statue uh, of Marx uh, by uh, the commission president, uh, right uh, ahead, we uh, will see that in Germany they will raise the statue of Lenin in Gelsenkirchen. So, what does it mean that the, uh, the, 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 this concept of guilt is not related to, uh, to the communism? <laughs> because, look, uh, if, you, if you said that we are measuring in the West uh, uh, our, uh, our um, uh, societies, uh, not by our the bravest moment, but by our failures. The largest failure of, 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 of the last hundred years is the communism. It failed in everything. And uh, uh, so why the young people in the West are now not just uh, not applying the, 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 the standard of, of, of this on, on, on the communism, but uh, exactly opposite they are even leaning towards those ideologies like 
we can see this in Seattle in in <laughs> in this so-called uh, uh, independent zone or how they call this uh, the, the red, celebrating you know the red June there. So why the West is so uh, you know did we something wrong to educate them about about the, the communism and its devastating legacy? Well, that's, that's uh, it's, I think, the most important unaddressed issue in our societies. Of course, this differs from country to country, and where you are, this is much more, um, much better known about for very obvious reasons. But I do believe that in Western Europe and in America, North America, um, the, we have an unresolved problem, and the unresolved problem is, uh, and uh, Jordan Peterson and I talked about this a couple of years ago in a joint interview, um, and came up with the version. We almost learned one of the lessons of the 20th century, which was to do with the fascist nightmare. We almost learned that lesson we have still learned almost no lesson from the other nightmare of the 20th century. And one way I think that Jordan and I came up with to sort of, you know, make that as it were clear is that whereas the political right knows where it goes wrong, where it can go wrong, there still appears to be no understanding or agreement on where the political left goes wrong or even that it can go wrong. So that, as I put it once, on the right, you know, you know, for instance, when people start playing games to do with racial identity, that they're in tricky territory. And you know that once they get onto games of racial superiority, you're in trouble. Now that is pretty much recognized not just across the political consensus, but on the political right in particular. What is the equivalent on the political left? What is the moment where the political left knows it goes wrong? Knows that it's going to hell? Uh, you know, we've seen in recent days more talk of appro appropriation of property or of wealth. Is that the left going wrong? Oh, you bet. I think so. Uh, does the political left as a whole think that? It doesn't seem so. Um, take the move that's been done post-Minnesota. Uh, Post-Minnesota, I'd have thought there was an awful lot of things you could raise as important uh, issues and a lot that can be improved in American policing. I certainly don't doubt that. But that your move should end up being, the primary slogan should end up being defund the police. I mean, surely that's, if, if the right goes wrong in an over-reliance on state structures, surely demanding the total eradication of a state structure like the police should be agreed upon to be the, pro the point to which it goes wrong. And I see, by the way, in this so semi-autonomous zone, the, the nightmarish, dystopian-sounding country of Chaz, that, that, that they're already experiencing what any child could have told them would occur when there were no police in an area. And I'm just still amazed that, you know, there was a, a politician, I think a Minnesotan council member, who was asked the other day about, uh, you know, who do you call if your house is being broken into? And this uh, official said, to even ask that question is to have a position of privilege. I, I mean, I wouldn't that whether I was privileged I wouldn't feel enormously privileged if I was being broken into in the middle of the night um but it just shows that the 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 the, the lack of ability to seriously think through consequences now as I say I think this is a result in part of an unlearned lesson of the 20th century and an, and and too little concentration on the nightmare of communism and I regard it as being a, a quite extraordinary that groups like Black Lives Matter can either be self-declaredly Marxist uh, 
or have a program that is absolutely indistinguishable from a Marxist program and be allowed free, a free run of it. Because we don't do that. You know, when we have sort of right wing, far right wing groups, like for instance, in the UK, we had a group called Britain First that sort of has, you know, it's sort of slightly football hooligans sort of stuff and, uh, you know, ugly, an ugly, ugly group. Uh, nobody says, oh, we shouldn't call, we shouldn't criticize them because they're called Britain first. You know, what's wrong with that? No, no, no nobody plays that game when it's a, a right wing movement doing that. Um, and as I say, I think that, I think that they, they, they are allowed to get away with a lot because of a historic issue we still haven't properly addressed and, uh, and, and, and a clever land grab that's gone on under the name uh, um, of this current group. I'd just add one thing to that, which is that for me, at any rate, this is all extraordinarily clarifying. I say at the end of the Madness of Crowds that there are certain questions we have to ask more. And one of the questions I, have, I, I say that we have to ask more, particularly to social justice identitarians, is to say, compared to what? Compared to what? So when they say our society is especially racist or homophobic or transphobic, we say compared to what? Now, as I say in the Madness of Crowds at this point, there is um, an almost uh, certain, almost certainty that you will not be given and I'll say, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, we could agree that there isn't, but we should still be better, et cetera. That, that's, that's true. That happens with a lot of people. However, some people, uh, uh, when you ask this question, they do have somewhere in mind. Uh, you and I, everyone present knows, we, we've heard this all our lives. You, a certain type of American leftist, for instance, cannot stop themselves weeping with pleasure about the Cuban healthcare system. You know, the American healthcare system has an awful lot of criticism to be made of it, as I think every healthcare system, but it has certain ones, I think, that are more able to be criticized than, say, the British one. Um, I think it is, it, there, there are, you know, you do when you fall through the net in, in America, you can fall very, very far. However, that, when that critique turns into, look how wonderful Cuban healthcare is, I think something else is going on here. When you say the American education system needs to be improved, I think, oh, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of evidence for that. Uh, when you say the British education system can be improved, I say, absolutely. You know, we have one in five children were leaving uh, school at the beginning of this decade, functionally illiterate in Britain. So I am all for educational reform and improvement in the UK. But when I say compared to where, and they say, you know, um, the Venezuelan education system is just so terrific. I think, why are you doing Venezuela on me? And what do you know about Venezuelan secondary school teaching? Now, of course, for very obvious reasons, these guys who do that have sort of eased off on the Venezuela uh, option for uh, the time being. But the Cuban healthcare system and the Cuban education system, and until quite recently, the Venezuelan everything, <laughs> Venezuelan economy. You do have the right to ask, is something else going on here that I need to know about? Might there be a certain underlying issue that you're trying to push on me? And I think that is the case. I think it's enormously revealing and it should be asked and I asked more, it should be identified more openly. Because I think what is going on is this unresolved issue still from the 20th century, where the left that allowed that to happen, and in many cases encouraged it, has basically never had to pay a price for it, never had a reckoning with it. And they, and as a result, we do have a substantial number of particularly young people who seriously exist in the belief that what was wrong with communism was that it wasn't tried well. And you can think that, but you shouldn't have a free run when you express that in a society. Without 
freedom of speech, free exchange of ideas, you, you, you cannot win an argument. If, if you have the only truth, uh, then there is, uh, there is no discussion. And I think uh, for a lot of young people in so-called West do not uh, understand that. I'm afraid uh, some young people in our countries as well. Is there something we can and should do about that uh, for, to redeem that? Uh, it's a very important and good question. <clears throat> um, I think there is, as you say, I mean, it's slightly different in every country. And I, I, my, my experience of, of being in your country is that there is indeed less of it, uh, um, but that it's growing as it is everywhere. Um, my own view, by the way, is that the political left also has to be involved in the answer to this. I, I recently wrote in a cover piece of The Spectator a, a, a defense of a form of liberalism, which it seems to me that I, mean, I sort of wanted to argue it in part to encourage the left to engage in uh, as much as I think the right should. And it is, it is that, that liberalism that, that argues that, you know, and basically what one might call the liberal mindset. Now, of course, we all know where this, this can go wrong, but the liberal mind that should be open, uh, the liberal mind that should believe in the free exchange of ideas, the liberal mind that believes that in a free exchange of ideas, good ideas will out, and that you can have confidence that uh, the debate can occur because, you know, for the reasons that, that uh, John Stuart Mill lays out and, and, and Milton did before him, that, 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 that to have the full panoply of the argument is necessary, um, not least to get to the truth, but as a secondary order of business to keep your own argument and your own understanding as limber and up to the moment as it should be. Um, I think there is one shortcut or hack, as people now say, in our Silicon, Domin Silicon Valley dominated world. There's one hack through this that I think I particularly urge, which is to say to people, particularly young people, people who are falling for this, how far are you willing to go? Just how far are you willing to go? So for instance, if you believe that somebody like JK Rowling <laughs> is, is her views are so reprehensible, she should not be, her children's book should not be published. If you think that, you are saying that a woman who says that they do not want women, and this is JK Rowling's complaint, they do not, women, they do not want women like themselves to be described because of the trans obsession as, quote, people who menstruate. If like JK Rowling, you think that is a demeaning way to describe women or to sum up women, if you think that her objecting to that makes her unfit for society, then you are saying that most women in our society are unfit to be in society. Are you willing to stand by that? What are you going to do about them, having excommunicated most women? You see, what J.K. Rowling said is agreed on by the majority of the population. Nobody in the majority of the population thinks anything she has said is in any way controversial. A small, ma a small band of absolute maniacs think that what she said is controversial, but most people do not. Nevertheless, the question needs to be asked, so what are you willing to do about it? How far are you willing to go? Are you willing to excommunicate most of the public? Are you willing to say most people in society are so bigoted they must not be heard from? Okay, what's the next phase? Do you think that people who have these reprehensible views about human biology, for instance, should not be teaching our children? I think you'd get a lot of young people say, absolutely, we don't want them anywhere near the classroom. Are you saying they shouldn't be employed by the state? Are you saying they shouldn't be employed in private companies? How far are you going to go on this? Because 
that seems to me to be the sort of tenor that this discussion is ending up in. This whole business of cancellation involves, it involves cancelling people who say things and believe things that most people also believe and say. So what these people in the name of social justice are setting up for us is an absolute hell. It's an absolute hell. And the, the likely thing is that they will realize this in their own time once it comes for something that's close to them. I have a version of this in the ultra feminist argument. Some of the ultra fourth wave feminists a few years ago liked picking up these really horrible slogans like men, all men are trash. That was one of them. Can you imagine a worse slogan to attract people to your cause? You know, just say that half the species are trash. Anyhow, the interesting thing was that whenever you turned this on to one of the people saying this and say, oh, is your father trash? Is your son trash? Is your husband trash? They wouldn't. Well, no, I, I don't really mean that. I, they would say, I mean other people, you know. My point is there are extraordinarily extreme slogans that have been going around in this era. But when they come close to you, it's hard to sustain them. There's another example. Um, believe all women, which I address in the women chapter in the Mans of Crowds. Believe all women is a deranged thing to say. It's like saying believe all men or believe all human beings. Like, you, you can't, this is not sustainable. Um, the people who did believe all women stopped if an allegation was made against their son. So there is a long-term, as it were, hope that these particular revolutionaries stop when the tumbrils come to their own door. But, as we know from the terror, among other historical events, an awful lot of misery is caused in the meantime, in waiting for that to happen. And that's why I believe that the job is to encourage young people to understand the absolute centrality of freedom of speech to our culture because without freedom of speech you don't have freedom of ideas you don't have the free exchange of ideas and and we know your part of the world in particular knows what that really means but i do think we're going to we've done a bad job on the right and the left of we've clearly done a bad job of educating the next generation in this because otherwise we wouldn't be where we are you asked what do they compare it with we know do they compare it always they compare it with utopia you know that. <laughs> not any real part of the world but utopia there's so many books have been written about communism so many books have compared hitler and stalin so many and yet the uh, the the the, uh, the mainline so-called conservatives or or, or people on the right uh, seems to not to care about this culture. Mm. We from the uh, Central Europe, we have some immunity against the, uh, the left <laughs> utopia. We are astonished that the Western politicians are not doing anything. I've said uh, for some years that one of the oddities of Western European countries is that we have elites of anti-elitists. You know, the, 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 the people in charge, strangely, for instance, seem to regard themselves as still, even when they're prime minister or deputy prime minister, still facing the sort of establishment that has been dead for decades, at least, in a country like Britain. Uh, we do not have, we are no longer, haven't been for a very long time, a country where sort of crusty old judges and uh, um, uh, um, conservative politicians from the shires have the cultural weather all on their side and therefore must be resisted by other people and so on. We haven't had, they have been railing against the non-existent establishment for decades and failed to realize that they are the establishment and that
you know, it's one of the reasons why sort of comedy is so bad from the left at the moment is because the targets they select for their satire are weaker than they are. You know, they, they, um, the, the comedian, a successful left-wing comedian in society is far more um, uh, powerful than a conservative MP in terms of changing public opinion. And so for the, the former to rail on the latter is, is, is a strangely unequal relationship today. Um, I believe that uh, you're, you're also, of course, right about this issue of the, the failure of the right to do anything other than the economic debate. I think there's several reasons for that. I mean, one is obviously just cowardice. Uh, another is that, um, and I've noticed this for some years, in fact, I think the last time I was in Prague, I mentioned this to an audience there, that I've always been struck that um, in my own generation, I'm now 40, in my own generation, it tended to be the case that people on the right were either um, sort of members of the Conservative Party who wished to make their way up the greasy pole of Conservative Party politics, or libertarians. And so these people had a lot to say on the economy and on culture. They basically didn't have anything to say other than legalized pot, which I've never regarded as on its own enough to do anything much. I mean, <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's a strange set of priorities to have to say what we do want to do is to lower taxes and then be able to smoke pot. Like, okay, have you got a schooling policy? Have you, got a university policy I mean, obviously there's a bit of a crossover in their eyes between those things but but um you know is there anything is there anything else you have to say and i think one of the reasons why that has come about is simply because a lot of conservatives have simply decided that you might as well they think they've lost anyway so you might as well just allow the thing to flow on by and keep as many of your tax dollars as possible and um, yes, I think that is, that is a failing, um, but it's, it's slightly more than that as well. It's, as I see it, uh, uh, and I'll come on to just fight on to the utopia point in a moment. They're sort of connected, aren't they? The conservatives have a di great difficulty explaining, Roger was always enormously eloquent on this issue. Uh, conservatives have a great problem explaining what it is that they're defending. And there are various reasons that I've thought about a lot and Roger has thought about a lot more. Uh, and they include an unwillingness of conservatives to talk about what they love because the language of criticism is easier than the language of love, not for everybody, but for a lot of conservatives it is. So that you take it as red, for instance, that of course you love the countryside, your landscape. Of course you love the great aspects of your culture but you end up not talking about them. You know, you end up talking about what the left's doing that's wrong and why this isn't the right way to understand the accumulation of capital and so on. And I think that it's, it's, it's a shame, but it means that, that we are bad at explaining several things. And one of them isn't just what we have, but why what we have is not self-sustaining unless we do that job. And I'm just struck repeatedly when speaking to the utopians, which you, you quite rightly uh, um, identify, when speaking to these utopians, I realize they make a fundamental error, which is their presumption that however, however you shake out the human species, what we have today in Prague or in London or in Budapest or in Berlin or Amsterdam is the normal way in which human beings live. So we're starting from this because this is, of course, this is normal. I mean, we have all of these injustices and so much work to do, but this is what society is. Sort of, this is the baseline. Now, of course, history shows what we enjoy in our countries and our cities at the moment is, is just an is infinitesimal it's a blip in human history it's, it's extraordinarily unusual it's very unusual for for instance the state to have the monopoly on violence as a species this is very very unusual 
it is very unusual to live in societies where when people have actual rights claims, never mind the sort of ones that I happen to feel like my feelings have been ever so slightly trodden upon this morning at 11 a.m. I mean, the real rights claims that anyone cares. Highly unusual in human history. And if there was a, a way to address the utopians that could be successful, it isn't just to point out the utopian nature of their dream. It's to point out the fundamental failing at the, the place where they start from in their understanding, which is this idea that what we have is the norm. And, you know, I think many people watching events of recent weeks, particularly in America, might have just had a reminder of this. Um, I think it takes a while. Um, it takes a while to forget things. And I think that a lot of people in America and people watching, for instance, will not forget fast the sights of policemen standing down and rioters just looting on Fifth Avenue. Because once you've seen that, of course, you know that that's possible. I mean, you should have known it was possible beforehand, but the fastest way to learn it's possible is to see it. And I am very struck by the fact that there will be a lot of people who will be piping down at the moment, but who have just seen some things that may, may, I hope, have suggested to them that, that the universe doesn't go always in the direction they seem to think it does. I mean, we've had another example of that in the COVID era. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how much this happened where you are, but in uh, the UK, there was a short but meaningful period where, of panic buying. And I've never seen that in my adult life. Uh, and it's something I think people won't forget. It's a strange, rather scary moment when suddenly people are willing to clamber over each other and fight to get a multi-pack of loo rolls. And I think that will stay with people a bit because it's a reminder that of something we should just always bear in mind, which is that chaos is never very far away. And you know, what people in Chaz will be discovering at the moment in a very harsh way is something that to some extent, a lesson that may to some extent be being imbibed in a slightly more watered down version in a lot of other places at the moment. I hope it is. I hope it is. If I look at what's happening to statutes in the United Kingdom, in the United States, it's like a bad parody on the great French Revolution. Conservatives surrendering to liberals, liberals surrendering to radicals, and radicals surrendering to passionate, fanatic, mad people. They use a guillotine in order to decapitate statutes. If they found objectionable, not only Churchill, but Mahatma Gandhi as well, who is that only remaining saint who is so unblemished that his or her statue could remain? The hatred against civilization is beyond reasonable conversation. It's like a bad attempt at a parody. Yeah, I, nobody can escape this, as you say. I mean, Gandhi uh, was pointed to at the very beginning of this as being a possible next stage. And already Gandhi's statue has also been attacked, I think, in London, um, uh, uh, or at least graffitied. Um, uh, you could do this the whole way along, by the way. I mean, one of the great moral heroes of the last century, Martin Luther King, um, in recent years, it's become clear that for all of his other incredible moral leadership and extraordinary courage uh, uh, and greatness, actually, um, that, you know, nevertheless, there were things that happened in his private life, which we would now regard as being deeply, deeply disturbing. Um, you know, maybe they'll stop when they get to Dr. King. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, it's uh, what you say about the, the, the sort of bad replay of the French Revolution is true. I think to a certain extent, I mean, I'm sort of slightly alluded to this at the beginning, but um, I, I do think to a great extent the madness of the crowd behavior in recent weeks in countries like my own 
is clearly something like a response to the lockdown, or at least the lockdown has helped it to burst out. Um, I mean, it's worth remembering in a country like Britain, the British government's um, uh, um, rules meant that unless you were married or, you know, lived with your partner, um, uh, uh, you were basically celibate for, um, well, three months. I mean, that's a straight, I mean, it, it sort of doesn't get referred to very much, but um, it's a sort of dystopian novel in it. I mean, nobody would have believed that the British government in 2020 could force all young people into celibacy. <laughs> Uh, there's going to be a response to that. And it's going to, I'm not saying it's desirable or, or, or permissible, but it's, it's, it's going to have a response. And the response in part was, you know, we're allowed out to protest against racism, so off we go. Uh, but you did definitely see that thing. One, I've been reading Tolstoy in lockdown, and there's a magnificent moment in War and Peace where Tolstoy describes the, 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 the nature of the lines in, the, uh, in battle and that as our armies march up to each other, they know that the gap between them is going to have to be fallen into. It's going to be run into, rushed into. But at the moment before the battle begins, the gap between where they are standing and the ground in which battle occurs is everything. It's, it's the biggest divide in the world. And you can feel in the crowds in recent weeks that they are dealing with something like that line. You can see them in Bristol as they're pulling down a statue of this 18th century figure and jumping up and down on its head like a deranged mob in the Middle East, uh, 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 but you were just, you know, jumping on their, their oppressor dictator's statue, you know, which would be understandable. Um, but doing this, but you then see with the, the crowds in London and elsewhere, and certainly the ones in America, they're testing the limits of violence. They're testing how far they can go. And we all know this. I mean, this is obviously a force in everyone's life uh, at some stage or indeed throughout it, but that, that the moment between being in that space and not being in it and testing where you can step, where you'll be allowed to step. The young man who started trying to set light to the flags on the Senate after the war dead in Whitehall. What was he doing but testing the limits of what he was allowed to do? Now, my view is that in these situations, the authorities massively failed. And in the case of Britain, the police massively failed in permitting too much early on. And as a result, other things happened. And we've seen that before. We saw it here in 2011 with the riots. But a more important point to make, maybe one of the closing points, is something that comes up from the other part of your question. And that is the nature of what is actually going on, what is actually being thrown out in the era that we're in. I'm enormously concerned about one thing in particular, which is not just the assault on our history, the attempt to apply a very radical form of politics to the mainstream, all of that. I'm deeply concerned about these things. But underneath it is something so sinister that we cannot allow it to happen. And it is this. It is the attempt to racialize even the concept of truth. Now, in re recent days, there have been, there's been a push of people arguing, for instance, particularly in America, against the STEM subjects and against science. Indeed, we've seen the science strike. This is because people claim science is uh, racist, people have been uh, not sufficiently open to ethnic minorities and, and more. And that STEM subjects are in some way biased, and there are different ways in which people say this, but it's that it privileges certain forms of knowledge. This is a form of sort of voodoo that is being attempted, which has to be identified and pushed back on. What it is, is it says, and indeed some people have said this, I quote some, some scholars and others, activists who've said this in the madness of crowds. People who say the concept of truth is a white cis heteronormative concept and construct. They say that mathematics is privileged favors white people and so on and that we need different forms of knowledge 
this is so dangerous because of course this even more than the attack on our history and on the past and assault and the unfair criti critiques of our society this is the biggest power grab i have seen the biggest assertion i have seen in my life it's different even from erasing the past it's saying it's not even battling over what is true or not it's saying truth itself is not just undesirable but dislikable because it favors a racial group and this the idea that you could say that truth must be not just disputed as we've seen throughout history but warred on as a part of the problem well that's something that you just have to gasp at when they try identify push back against and say if you're willing to do that then everything's on the table because that to war on something so fundamental not to our civilization but to civilization period no that's not going to happen uh, thank you very much for being with us and uh, we would love to have you in person once uh, the book is here uh, because you know this remote uh, uh, session it's effective of course but uh, you know to have a dinner after your uh, lecture in prague and more informal conversation uh, we would love you thank you everybody see you in prague